Well, welcome everybody to the panel discussion on bridging the knowledge gap between human or human animal and non-human animal health. I'm Dr. Christine Green. I'm your moderator today. I am a, a board certified family physician and I've treated uh, chronic infectious disease for almost 40 years. I sit on the board of Invisible International and I am the co-director of education. I have done many um, activities surrounding education in tick-borne disease over the length of my career. And I, I must say this is the most exciting um, role I have played in that the continuing medical education we're doing and the association with One Health practitioners, I think may finally help us understand these chronic infectious diseases, chronic vector-borne diseases, and chronic tick-borne diseases. So I'm happy to be your moderator today. And I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves. So Dr. Lewandrowski, Elizabeth Lewandrowski, can you introduce yourself? My name is Elizabeth Lewandrowski. Uh, I'm uh, a, uh, an assistant uh, professor of pathology at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, I'm a research faculty and clinical laboratory scientist at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Department of Pathology. And I am also a research director for the Invisible International. And I published extensively on uh, Lyme disease and tick borne illness uh, uh, related um, field. Uh, I'm also on the board of a Harvard Medical School Lyme disease education initiatives. I have organized a three CME conference at Harvard Medical School, and I also had one collaboration conference organized at Stanford campus. So I'm a very um, thrilled we have a today's uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Okay, could Dr. Ed Breitschwert, could you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be a part of this panel and this initiative to bring human medicine and veterinary medicine closer together. Um, I'm the Melanie S. Steele Professor of Medicine and Infectious Disease at the College of Veterinary Medicine at North Carolina State University. I'm also an adjunct professor of medicine division of infectious disease at Duke University. Historically, I've been fortunate, and as I've gotten a little further down the road, I even consider myself more fortunate to have been able to start studying vector transmitted infectious diseases first in animals uh, with Rocky Mountain spotted fever, ehrlichiosis, babesiosis, and ultimately um, focusing a tremendous amount of our research effort on the genus Bartonella. So I think as you will hear from this panel, we're all very excited about exchanging knowledge between what we know in animal health and what's known in human health um, because we feel like this approach will get us to answers for our patients much, much quicker. Thank you. And Dr. Stephen Phillips, can you tell us about you? Hi, thank you very much for Visible International and Harvard Medical School for allowing me to participate. I am a board certified internist. I have uh, been in practice for nearly 30 years. I have one of the largest practices devoted solely to the chronic illness manifestations related to vector borne infections. I started my research in Lyme and other vector borne infections during residency at Yale. I uh, went on to um, uh, be participating as principal investigator in new Lyme diagnostic testing, served as a Lyme disease expert for um, five states throughout New England in the passing of legislation to protect uh, Lyme patients and uh, public policy on, on Lyme disease. I've also um, participated in public policy hearings in Sweden to um, impact how they deal with the, uh, this epidemic because it really is a worldwide phenomenon. Um, I'm the author of a best-selling book, Chronic, The Hidden Clothes of the Autoimmune Pandemic and How to Get Well Again. 
how to get healthy again. And um, I was actually endorsed by Dr. George Church of Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very, very excited to be here because uh, this is uh, this has been a, a pandemic that's been on the nose of people for a very, very long time. And particularly Bartonellosis is an emerging infectious disease, which is relatively newly recognized. And I'm in this for not only professional reasons, but my family has been devastatingly impacted by these chronic infections. And that's what's motivated me in my research for, like I said, almost 30 years. Thank you. And Dr. Charlotte Mao. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlotte Mao. I'm delighted to be part of this panel. I am a pediatric infectious disease physician uh, who serves as the curriculum director for Invisible International. I became very interested in physician education around uh, vector-borne diseases and Lyme disease uh, because of my own experience um, uh, learning about Lyme disease. and. I, uh, I had my medical education at Harvard um, and my medical training at uh, Children's, Boston Children's Hospital and spent the first 25 years of my career there, uh, originally specializing in pediatric HIV, both clinical care and clinical research. Uh, and then approximately a decade ago, I became very interested in Lyme and vector-borne uh, infections as a result of seeing patients in the general infectious diseases clinic there. And I really, I turned my focus to Lyme and tick-borne diseases. Uh, and I was the consulting infectious disease specialist at a multidisciplinary pediatric clinic uh, for complex, uh, for children and teenagers with complex Lyme disease at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston uh, and a member of the infectious diseases division at uh, pediatric infectious diseases division at Mass General. Uh, and I'm currently serving uh, as I said before, as the curriculum director of Invisible International and very proud to work on our educational platform uh, to provide comprehensive uh, education um, on Lyme and vector borne uh, infections uh, to uh, physicians and other clinicians. Thank you. And so those are our panelists. And what we're hoping to start with today is to look at how the approach to the human animal patient <laughs> by the human animal docs um, informs the approach by the, shall we call them the animal animal docs <laughs> um, and vice versa. And we're going to start off with the patient in the exam, in the diagnosis. So I wonder, Dr. Breitschwert, if you could talk about in, in what I imagine are patients who cannot give you a history, if you can talk about the importance of the history in a presenting patient and, and how one approaches that. Certainly. One of the things that I've said to interns and residents for a number of years is get a good medical history, run your test, hope you come up with a diagnosis. <laughs> when you don't, go back and get the history. Um, and clearly, uh, I usually repeat that several times, just get the history, get the history, and when you finish, go back and get the history so that they actually hear and understand the importance of a medical history in regard to diagnosis. One of the, the clear differences, I think, in veterinary medicine versus human medicine is that most of our patients are exposed to a variety of vectors, whether it's a tick, a flea, a mosquito, um, uh, louse um, with much greater frequency than occurs in human medicine. And I often use the example, if you happen to own a Labrador retriever, golden retriever, or like myself, a German short hair pointer, there is no way they're going to walk down a sidewalk and stay on that sidewalk unless you have a leash on them because they're going to run into the bushes adjacent to the grass. And clearly with our tick-borne diseases, that's where they're gonna find those. So 
our students are taught to one, ask the question, has your dog ever been exposed to a tick, a flea? Is your dog on a preventative for heartworm disease, which is a mosquito transmitted disease? So that is just absolutely standard history for veterinarians in general practice, as well as a you know, veterinarian like myself at an institutional practice when our students are admitting cases. All right. And Dr. Mao, since um, since at least when I was in med school 100 years ago, <laughs> pediatrics was likened sometime to veterinary medicine. Can, can you talk to us about history and the importance of, of your assessment of a patient? Uh, yeah, I have to agree entirely with Dr. Reitschwert on the importance of history, the primacy of it. Um, and I would say in terms of um, Lyme disease and other vector-borne infections, some of the things that I really came to learn um, about taking a really excellent history. Um, uh, one is uh, that you really need to know both the common and the uncommon manifestations of vector-borne infections. These infections are very common and uh, they're common enough that when you see and hear enough about some of, uh, hear enough, pa about enough patients, uh, you realize that some of the manifestations that are considered uncommon are perhaps uh, not as atypical as you originally thought. Um, and they can be important clues in a constellation of symptoms and signs. Uh, so you really want, I think, to read uh, extensively the literature on clinical presentations of Lyme disease, uh, including the older literature on Lyme disease, where there's some really beautiful descriptions of the diversity of uh, symptoms uh, and uh, a lot about uh, here I'm talking specifically about Lyme disease, um, neuroborreliosis, including the European literature to really understand the diversity of presentations. Um, you want to get a very thorough review of systems. Uh, and I think it's helpful to have checklists for patients to fill out before the visit. Uh, and uh, you want to know that uh, symptoms can fluctuate that they can wax and wane, come and go. Uh, patients can have good and bad days. And that's something that I think clinicians don't naturally think about in terms of an infectious disease. Um, but that very much can be the case for a number of vector-borne infections that can be chronic and persistent um, and chronic and recurrent uh, in their manifestations. Uh, you want to obtain a history, not just starting from the time the patient believes is the onset of their illness, but also preceding symptoms that they might not realize at all could in fact also be related uh, to Lyme or other uh, uh, vector-borne in infections. Uh, you want to get a complete environmental exposure history as well. And so this is something that I just really learned on on-the-job training is that um, Lyme disease I see it as very much a multiple hits kind of um, illness uh, where it's not just Borrelia burgdorferi, but also other infections, certainly concomitant infections, other vector-borne infections, but also even uh, potential environmental toxic exposures uh, that can affect presentation. And for instance, and this is all part of the One Health picture, um, mycotoxins produced by certain mold species really can have an impact uh, on Lyme, Bartonella, a number of these uh, vector-borne infections. Uh, and uh, so I guess those are some of the main points I would bring up in really getting a very comprehensive history. All right. And Dr. Phillips, your thoughts? Well, I, I couldn't agree more about the importance of history. Um, I'm the only one on the panel that actually gets to have a history from adults, it seems. And uh, it's it's a luxury. But, you know, most doctors, uh, we learn this in med school, we get 90% of our information from history, and then we proceed to ignore it. My initial um, 
visits are typically between two and a half and three hours long, sometimes longer. And the bulk of that is taking a history. And there are, uh, I would uh, further describe common and uncommon features like Dr. Mao had said, but also I'll characterize them as stereotypical and non-stereotypical. Because the stereotypes will do us in with these illnesses. Because if I diagnose patients just based on stereotypical presentations, I would miss probably 95% of the cases. And uh, case in point, I think about a veterinarian who was in the hospital for two weeks with pancytopenia and recurring fevers. And the diagnosis of bartonellosis was missed by ID docs of a, a large, you know, esteemed hospital in Connecticut, university-based hospital. So it, despite me bringing it up at least 10 times, saying I think this person has bartonellosis against this person, it was, it was basically um, shoved off to the side. And she, she almost died um, because of this focus on stereotypical presentations, because how common do you see pancytopenia in humans with Bartonella? It's actually really rare. You see uh, neutropenia and thrombocytopenia pretty commonly, but to see all three cell lines together is actually pretty uncommon, but she had it. And, um, and it's just, just an example. So I don't know if it's appropriate at this time to go over some features that I see in humans that haven't really been published that I think could help. I don't know if they well, would I translate. Well, I think it's very to... appropriate. And... Okay, great. Yeah. I don't think it would translate to veterinary medicine because I don't know if the non-human animals develop these features as well. But one thing that we see in um, humans with bartonellosis, for example, that I think is, even though myoclonus has been published with Lyme, it does seem to be a far more common event in bartonellosis. And associated with that, I see giveaway weakness and giveaway weakness. We're taught in med school that it's psychiatric because doctors can't find a neurologic pathway to explain giveaway weakness, but I see it very frequently. And I find it interesting that cataplexy, which is associated with narcolepsy, which is basically almost identical to giveaway weakness is an accepted neurologic, you know, syndrome. Then when it's not associated with narcolepsy, we completely ignore it. But this I see with Bartonella patients. I also see, subclinical pancreatitis on a regular basis with Bartonella patients. They just come in with, you know, the cutoff for lipase, pancreas enzymes is typically 60 at most labs. People are coming in with two and three hundreds just walking off the street on a regular basis. I mentioned low white counts and low platelets. Some Bartonella patients have chronically elevated C-reactive proteins, which again, not at all specific, but it's not something you typically see with Lyme and it's something that you typically see with Things like babesia and ehrlichiosis and anaplasma during acute, you know, their acute illness only and not, not in a chronic sense. Um, other things we see with Bartonella patients is sometimes elevated vascular endothelial growth factors, which we don't see with other subsets. And there's, in some patients, a predominance of axial skeletal involvement whenever I see sternoclavicular joint disease. You know, stereotypes of things like tuberculosis can do this in humans, but when we look at infectious causes of spondylopropathies, Bartonella is number one, two, and three for me, and I, I find that to be um, a common thing. And also, when I see uh, teenagers with PANS, you know, um, pediatric, you know, it's a neuropsychiatric syndrome, Bartonella tops the list of the, the main drivers of PANS, even though Lyme has been implicated, and obviously strep, I think that Bartonella is a a huge driver of pounds. So just some some things to burst some stereotypes. I wonder, um, Ed, if you have any correlations or are those surprising to you based on your non-human animal patients? Yeah, what Steve just said brings a case that we've actually published of a pancytopenic um, dog being managed by an internist in Florida um, and had a very nice workup and it was thought to be a immune-mediated disease with damage to the bone marrow. Um, obviously, the treatment would be suppress the immune system, which I think several of us on this panel are not proponents of suppressing immune systems in patients with chronic infections. And the dog subsequently developed bacillary angiomatosis, which is obviously associated with immunosuppression in humans. And 
fortunately, the dog was biopsied by a veterinary dermatologist sent to a dermatopathologist who specializes in looking at those lesions. She knew about the human literature on bacillary angiomatosis, again, in the context of One Health. Um, if she had not known about the human literature on bacillary angiomatosis, she would never have recommended that the veterinarians contact us. And that dog ended up being infected with a Bartonella species that we actually discovered here uh, in a dog with endocarditis that's called Bartonella vinsonii subspecies Burkhoffi. But I think, um, you know, clearly one of the most important ways that One Health might help us um, as veterinarians and physicians is looking at patterns of disease that occur in animals with the same type of patterns that occur in humans. And we actually published a manuscript that proposed an addition to Cook's postulates that we termed the comparative infectious disease postulate. And part of that, again, was um, on the basis of kind of taking this One Health approach to trying to understand complex chronic infections. And that particular managed manuscript um, is in comparative pathology and has physicians and veterinarians and pathologists and microbiologists and a fair number of my drinking buddies um, <laughs> as co-authors. So we, we really, and, and we used examples of histopathologic diagnoses where there was microbiological confirmation of one or more infectious agents, and you had to have at least three species to be able to suggest that that postulate was satisfied. So one example would be granulomatous hepatitis, which has now been reported in dogs, in horses, and in humans in association with documented Bartonella infection. Interesting. And Steve, I'm going to ask you what, uh, to describe breakaway weakness. Breakaway weakness is like somebody will um, drop the pencil and be able to pick the pencil up no problem or the knees buckle out. Um, and, and when it's mild, you know, it's not a big deal, but I have patients that have been in wheelchairs because they're falling 50 times a day and smashing their face open. The neurologists are saying that the same the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist have nothing wrong with them. And it's something neurologic and they go back and forth like a ping pong ball. And, um, you know, I even had a uh, physical therapist drop patients, not believing them because again, we're taught this weird thing in med school. This is because we can't figure out because it's unknown. Well, there's a lot of things that are unknown in medicine. That's why we practice medicine. It's uh, this default setting to assume psychiatric is, is really damaging. And one other thing I wanted to add, I, I can't believe I actually didn't add it to the list, is striae. Ed, do they have, do any of the animals develop striae, stretch marks? So, so tracks, as they're called. <laughs> yeah, Bartonella so tracks or it. We've seen lesions in which we've documented Bartonella like nodular paniculitis or granulomatous paniculitis, which often in veterinary medicine has been considered idiopathic and therapy directed at that um, particular entity has resulted in resolution. So at least it wasn't really idiopathic. And we do believe that the response to therapy was related to Bartonella. We've also seen Bartonella cases where um, they seem to develop a hypersensitivity reaction, even with clipping the skin sometimes, uh, the hair um, from the skin, I should say. Um, but it's, it, as I think, we talk about learning from each other when the suggestion was made that Bartonella infection actually caused the stria, stria-like lesions or tracts. Um, I really question it as a Bartonella researcher, but Ricardo Maggi and I joke all the time now that we were wrong and there clearly is a very strong association. And I think eventually human dermatologists will further investigate that and support that it's not just as association, but causation. And we're way behind human medicine in this regard because, um, 
you know, those lesions had been recognized and associated by physicians for a number of years with Bartonella infection. So um, I think the veterinary dermatologists still have to learn to spell Bartonella. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think um, certainly when I've seen some of the tracks that I believe are Bartonella tracks on the patient, they are unique. They they are not stretch marks. They don't go in the way of stretch marks. They don't look the same. You know, they grow, they come back, they come and go. Um, it, it's quite interesting. I One of the comments I would make that I've learned in treating vector-borne disease, I pride myself on doing a really good history finding out the health of the patient before whatever happened started so I get a sense of you know their baseline health etc but one of the things I did not do was ask basic vector exposure question does your dog sleep with you in your bed you know <laughs> have you ever found ticks in your bed from your dog you think um you know do you have pets and how do you take care of the pets and do you clean the litter box and um, those type of exposure question and and I went to a family practice program I trained at Stanford for residency and it was really good but but I don't think when I came out and prepared my HMP and my review of systems I didn't have do you have a pet in there <laughs> So I do think in history, one of the one health concepts is realizing, you know, that that itchy skin dog may be an itchy skin human with something too. So Elizabeth, I know you're the laboratory representative here, but anything you want to add to history? Uh, I'm curious, uh, following your saying the dogs uh, sleep on the bed, does anybody know if the tick will bite a second time? If the tick bite the dog and drop off in bed, would it bite the human again? I mean, are they for done? Well, there, some there. ticks clearly will, and some ticks will not have attached to the dog if they were just, you know, picked up outside. So um, clearly a dog can transport ticks into the household. I think one thing that needs to be emphasized both in veterinary medicine and human medicine is the importance of fleas because fleas, the common cat flea that's called Tenocephalides felis, is ubiquitous through much of the world. Um, and you know, one of the examples that comes to mind is a woman that we diagnosed Bartonella infection with and her disease was a cancer in her liver called epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. Um, and Steve's alluded to the fact that Bartonella uh, induces the production of VEGF, and there's it's certainly part of the pathogenesis for bacillary angiomatosis and peliosis hepatis. But the importance of this woman's medical history, and getting back to what Chris said, is she got so many flea bites in a hostel in San Francisco during a trip through the United States that she had to be hospitalized wow. um, for a period of time due to the reactions that she had. And, you know, we got involved many years later when she actually had this tumor. But if you ask me when I think she got her Bartonella infection, it was in that hostel in San Francisco several, several years earlier. Wow. Yeah. I'm, uh, one, one of the things I wondered is, you know, can, and clearly we can, can the veterinarians and the human physicians inform each other? And I had a patient yesterday that I'm curious about. This is a long-term Lyme patient, chronic fatigue. Um, and she happened to say she was leaving. Boy, I've been itching. <laughs> For, for the last two months, my head and my shoulders, they just itch. And she had shown me a beautiful picture of her kitty. Um, and then she said, oh, my cat's itching too. And I thought, 
Oh, I'm glad I have this panel tomorrow. <laughs> um, and so I said to her, take your cat to the veterinarian and just explore what might be going on that maybe jump to you or vice versa. So uh, is that appropriate? <laughs> Absolutely, Chris. And when, when I lecture to veterinarians, um, partly because I've gotten a little older and I'm not afraid to say almost anything to a veterinarian at least, I actually suggest to them that in the next year, I challenge them to contact a local physician in their little town or area um, about something that relates to one of their animal patients. We're all familiar with the manuscript that came out over a decade ago that says, you know, 75% of all emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. And since that has been published, there have been a bunch of others added to the list. So, you know, if they're zoonotic and, you know, from the veterinary perspective, the way I look at zoonoses is it's oftentimes an infection in the animal and an infection in the human. The animal tolerates that infection a lot better than the human. And it's never good when it makes the jump out of the animal into the human. So, you know, I think physicians should feel free to call veterinarians in a setting like that and say, you know, what might be causing this cat to scratch. So scabies or copic mange would be a candidate. Uh, Chiatiello, which is a mite and mite transmission, rat mite transmission in the United States and pigeon mite transmission um, in Europe have been implicated in Bartonella transmission. So we, again, certainly in regard to our panel and the message we want to send to everybody listening out there throughout the world is that um, veterinarians need to feel comfortable talking to physicians and physicians um, need to feel comfortable talking to a veterinarian. I want to add something on too to what uh, Dr. Phillips said about uh, Bartonella being a potential uh, agent causing PANS, which is Pediatric Acute Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, uh, formerly known as or also known as PANDAS, uh, which is Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Strep. Um, and um, basically, uh, Bartonella can have a whole variety of neuropsychiatric manifestations. That is something that I was not aware of, um, you know, through my medical training. And uh, I saw a lot of children and teenagers uh, with PANS type of presentations uh, at the Dean Center Pediatric Clinic uh, for Lyme disease. Uh, and a number of them would come in also with the striae, that so-called striae that we talked about, those cutaneous tracts. Uh, and I think, you know, when you see a child or a teenager with new onset neuropsychiatric symptoms um, and those marks, you have to think about Bartonella uh, uh, definitely uh, as a primary cause. Um, so uh, that is something that uh, I learned about from Dr. Breitschwert, <laughs> who published uh, cases showing uh, that uh, Bartonella could actually be found in uh, the striae-like lesions uh, uh, from the thigh, I believe it was, um, the thigh skin of a teenager. And if there's one thing that to hammer home that's easy for uh, if, if first-year students are watching this when they graduate to be on the look for everything, obviously, but I saw a patient literally yesterday that came in from Texas who was 27 years old, striae all over his body. He's got depressed ejection fraction, tons of cardiac symptoms to the point of cardiac MRI. And he's been sick for years and nobody has picked up in his pattern. His pattern is so obvious when you look at it from a couple of miles up. Um, something else that I didn't speak about that happens with some Bartonella patients and it happens frequently with brucellosis, it's a stereotype for brucellosis. One of the other names for brucellosis is undulant fever because it gets worse in the afternoons. So a lot of patients with Bartonella will tell me that their symptoms flare up in the late afternoons. So this guy had stria all over. He had uh, cardiac um, dysfunction with predominant right ventricular dysfunction. And I don't know if we, we haven't talked about today these cases of the Swedish orienteers that had right heart failure that was um, biopsy proven to be uh, Bartonella driven. 
And I've seen that in young people. I've seen that several times already where um, as part of the workup, we send them for rapid vertigram that they're in right heart failure and they get a massive cardiac workup. And it's a very, very specific finding when you see predominant right ventricular involvement for, for Bartonella. And uh, and also something I find you now that I'm thinking about more stuff that's more specific with Bartonella, aside from what I mentioned earlier, is also when there's testicular pain. I think back to Brussel. Like when I was first starting studying Lyme, I looked at syphilis to understand Lyme better because it was back in the 90s and there wasn't enough good research on Lyme. And then when I started trying to look into Bartonella, I was really studying brucellosis quite a bit because whatever Brucella can do, Bartonella can do and back, and, you know, vice versa, pretty much. And Brucella is famous for causing brucellosis related orchitis. And when patients come in with testicular pain, epididymitis, and this type of diagnosis, a lot of them also localized to the Bartonella subgroup. And so this guy had it all. And something interesting that this guy had from yesterday is aside from his trie, Again, 27, he's had a CAT scan before he saw me, and he's got multiple colonic diverticuli and diverticular of his bladder. And I have to wonder, because it's not really published, but I, have, I have saw a recent other case where a patient after um, long-term diagnosis of Bartonellosis that is you know, seropositive, she ended up getting recurrent diverticulitis and the section of colon was taken out to look at her diverticular disease was PCR positive uh, for Bartonella. And I have to wonder if some of these uh, colonic diverticuli are analogous to these weakening of elastic tissues in the colon. And, you know, I do think that many of these things are multifactorial. You know, I mean, it's clear, it's clear um, dietary issues when it comes to colonic diverticuli and it's hereditary issues and everything else. But maybe this is another potential um, feature that could cause diverticular disease that's being missed because it's very, very rare to have a 27 year old just yeah. completely have a colon full of diverticula and have a bladder diverticulum on top of them. And his striae are very deep and red and angry looking. So if I can, if we can raise um, awareness about this very, very obvious feature. And the other weird thing about striae that when we see with Bartonella, I've never seen it in an older adult. I only see it, the oldest I've ever seen striae development was a 32 year old. And I don't know why that is, but I've never seen it like the new a person, a 55 year old comes in with a case of three years of illness. I've never seen stray develop that person. It's interesting in pediatrics. I think that uh, tend to see it in uh, older children and teenagers. So is there perhaps some type of hormonal influence um, that that predisposes you to develop these? It, Chris, one, one thing we haven't touched on, which is, I'm sure, obvious to everybody on the panel and most of the people listening, is the fact that we're actually moving infectious diseases around the world at a rate that's unprecedented in human history. And obviously, COVID is an example, monkeypox is an example, the different strains of flu that come across every year. Um, the, the differences in those diseases and the diseases that most of us as panelists are interested in um, being internists and pediatric infectious disease physician and pathologists are the chronic diseases where, you know, as Steve just so eloquently illustrated with this young man from Texas, um, when he became infected, how long he's been infected and what the long-term consequences of that, that infection are, are factors that are very, very difficult to assess. But I, I'll give you an example. The phone call that I did immediately before coming over here for our panel discussion um, is from Eastern North Carolina, fortunately right on the ocean where it's beautiful today. Mm -hmm. And a US soldier brought a German shepherd back with him from Baghdad. Oh. And we know that in Baghdad, dogs have Bartonella mariu, or what is now referred to as Canadatus Bartonella mariu, because no one's ever been able to isolate that particular Bartonella. And we don't know exactly how it's transmitted, so we don't know what vectors involved. But what we do know is if you test dogs outside of Baghdad in the country, you find a very low prevalence. But if you tested dogs immediately following the Iraqi war, within that area, you can find this organism by PCR and sequencing fairly frequently in the blood. 
And this dog, every since it's gotten to the United States, has had one complication after the next complication after the next complication. So it's been over here about two and a half years, and we will be testing this dog and culturing the blood for Bartonella. So I think one of the questions or one of the things we are trying to do um, at Invisible is is get these potential infections diagnosed as early as possible. And we've been talking a lot about Bartonella. What history questions are important to make sure that the examiner will be able to put Bartonella or Lyme, et cetera, into the differential? If you have an early Bartonella case, I know fleas transmit. What what other vectors do we think about, or or risk factors might be we want to cover in history? Well, maybe I can do the vectors, and then the physicians can do the things that key them into um, presentation from the history, but. As far as I can tell, Bartonella species, of which there are now over 40 named species, are transmitted by more types of vectors than any other infectious agent that we know about. And so sand flies in South America, particularly in Peru and Ecuador, transmit Bartonella bacilliformis. Um, Bartonella quintana, the cause of trench fever or urban trench fever, which um, is seen throughout many of the cities in the United States is transmitted by the human body louse and likely by other means, since many of the people that are being proven to be infected with that particular agent don't have a exposure to human body lice. Um, the Europeans have documented Bartonella quintana in bid bugs and have suggested from laboratory studies that bid bugs are competent for transmission. Um, we've actually looked at bid bugs from the United States and we were unable to find Bartonella quintana in bid bugs, but that doesn't mean it doesn't occur in certain areas and just the bid bugs that we tested. Fleas, as you mentioned, are perhaps one of the most important sources of Bartonella transmission for cats, dogs, and humans. Um, and they can transmit three Bartonella species in the laboratory, Henselae. Bartonella hensilae, Bartonella cholerae, and Bartonella clerigiae. And it is also suggested that they can transmit Bartonella quintana based on at least case-based evidence that has been published. Um, biting flies have transmitted um, Bartonella, and that's the most common transmission to cattle, to ruminants. Um, keds, which are wingless flies, transmit Bartonella species to deer um, and to sheep. So, and each of these Bartonellas have a different name that I'm not bringing up, um, both in the interest of time and sanity. But I, I think one of the important parts is that we did not know any cat, dog, horse, or human ever got infected with the genus Bartonella on the North American continent and much of the world before 1990. And if it were not for the AIDS epidemic, we wouldn't have a panel discussion today that even included Bartonella. So it took that immunocompromised group of individuals for us to initially find two Bartonellas, Bartonella quintana and Bartonella henselae, um, actually done by David Relman out there in Stanford with PCR amplification and sequencing to turn into what literally is a epidemic of discovery of species of which my count is 18 have either been associated with disease in a dog or a human or both. And in many instances, it's both. Amazing. So if, if um, Dr. Mao and Dr. Phillips, what if we wrap up the... Uh, I have a question. Is there a vaccine for Bartonella for the animals? There is not. And in my opinion, there should be. And I've certainly expressed that opinion to veterinary pharmacology. But uh, just like in human medicine, for a company to undertake a vaccine development um, 
it's a very complicated process, a very costly process, and everyone is not quite convinced yet that that vaccine is needed. So let's wrap up the clinical and maybe include history and exam. So if, if a sick patient walks in <laughs> and you don't necessarily suspect vector, but you just have this chronically or acutely sick, I guess we want to look at the acute, um, any wrap up for kind of pearls of what you might look at for Bartonella, might look at for Lyme, Dr. Phillips or Dr. Mao? Well, Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, uh, Steve mentioned a lot of the clinical clues to think about Bartonella. The um, presentation that pediatricians are most familiar with, physicians in general, for Bartonella is uh, acute Bartonella with cat scratch disease, where you have uh, lymph node swelling um, in the area where you got a scratch from a cat, so on your arm, under the armpit. Um, and uh, it can be... Uh, you know, uh, sometimes associated with fever or some other nonspecific symptoms, but sometimes you'll just have the lymph node swelling. Um, but when you actually look into the literature on the, uh, on Bartonella, it's quite surprising the really heterogeneous range of symptoms um, that you can see. I mentioned neuropsychiatric manifestations. Um, that's one very prominent manifestation uh, that I would see uh, in patients. And um, I think an important thing to point out, too, is that um, while you can see patients uh, with acute presentations, um, this is an infection that is actually quite common if you look at seroprevalence um, studies. Um, around the world. Um, they vary, but there are rather shockingly high rates of, of, of baseline seroprevalence in healthy people um, who don't have symptoms uh, in some areas of the world. For instance, in German university students, it was reported at 30%. And there's a study looking at Italian school children even as high as 60%. Um, so what is it that can cause the infection to go from an uh, asymptomatic uh, infection to uh, something, you know, with, with acute symptoms or chronic symptoms? Um, that's a big question. Um, but uh, I think it's important then to look, uh, as I said before, not just at sort of new acute manifestations, but also um, prior chronic or chronic recurrent manifestations that a patient um, might not even suspect could be related yeah. to this infection. So, can I add something? so Charlotte and I actually think alike on a lot, a lot of levels. And I was going to mention that, you know, we're talking about disease and yet we are uh, evolutionary, evolutionarily very well equipped to fight these infections off and they are as common as Charlotte has said, both for Lyme and Bartonella, shockingly common around the world. And I have now well over 150, 200 patients who have been away from my practice for five, 10 years and been fine after treatment who've come back after COVID and they've had recurrent symptoms of their illness mm -hmm. and treat them mm -hmm. and they do okay again and then go away. And we've had the same conversation every time saying mm -hmm. that, you know, that if you didn't know you had Lyme or Bartonella or, you know, these things, before you'd be diagnosed with long COVID right now. And then my nurse practitioners are seeing long COVID patients, finding evidence of vector borne infections, treating those infections, and the patients are doing remarkably better. So then you have to ask yourself what component of underlying previously asymptomatic vector borne infections have become symptomatic after immune dysregulation after COVID. I'm not saying it's the whole thing, obviously not, because SARS-CoV-2, there's excellent data showing that the virus persists really long-term. What does it do when it persists? Aside from causing coagulopathy, it causes immune dysregulation and things that were previously asymptomatic can now become symptomatic. I think this is a very, very major uh, feature of long COVID that's being missed by a lot of people that are doing research in this area because we're getting uh, the bulk of the patients that come on long COVID to be well. 
and I just want to put that in the ear of people who are, are listening to, to, to look for these things in long COVID patients. And if you look at the symptom list of long COVID and chronic Lyme, <laughs> you will see it's 95% overlapping. And uh, as soon as I heard that uh, a symptom on long COVID was a, a chronic internal vibration sensation, <laughs> which I hear like 10 times a day, literally, as soon as I heard that that was on a long COVID list, I said, wait a second, this is such a weird symptom. I'm, I'm sure that there's a component of vector-borne infection as part of this complex, you know, multi-system picture. So that's what I think. There's a study published on that one, uh, right? Do you recall there's there, patients? Most recently, there was something published on yeah. internal vibration sensation. Yeah, we just say, you know, the long COVID patient, there's a, a huge percentage of them, they actually are test positive for Lyme disease. Uh, so... Yeah, no, I think it's, so, it's something that's going to get more attention as we go along. And I think that really long COVID has broadened the, the horizons for looking at chronic vector-borne patients as well, because I realize that chronic illness, which has been, you know, really, let's face it, it's been marginalized for a lot of, you know, stuff that's hard to decipher has been um, shoved to the side and patients are treated symptomatically and it's been horrible for folks. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, um, so one, one form... Well, one form of transmission we haven't discussed is needle stick transmission. And I've, many of our studies that have looked at reasonably large populations of veterinarians have found um, evidence of Bartonella in the blood of up to 28% of the people that were tested. So needle stick transmission from a dog or a cat to a veterinarian has been reported um, and I know I collaborate with some human physicians in Brazil that are extremely concerned about blood transfusion transmission of Bartonella, which is essentially being ignored totally at this point in time. But I think is yeah. we, we demonstrated in the very first experiments that we did because we used cats that had induced cat scratch disease in their owners. We took their blood and we infected specific pathogen free cats and every cat became infected. <laughs> I um, brought that to the attention of uh, the Red Cross in Connecticut, not for Bartonella, but for Lyme years ago, and they didn't want to look into it. And mm -hmm. um, so nothing's really been done in that regard. But I have um, well, something that was approximately 10 patients who have very well documented histories of getting sick after transfusions. And that is when everything started after. And it's usually transfusion of a few units, not single unit transfusions. Very interesting. Not many bugs in the blood. So clinically, I think um, to, to be very careful about gathering symptoms, the timeline, staying open to the fact that just because they had COVID a month ago doesn't mean it's necessarily COVID now um, is, is the bottom line. I'd like to move to testing. Actually, one thing I just want to add to what... Um, Dr. Phillips said about um, Bartonella uh, or COVID com, uh, potentially contributing to the activation or reactivation of Bartonella in addition to immune dysfunction uh, potentially from SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think another potential mechanism to consider is that uh, a niche or reservoir of Bartonella is felt to uh, be possibly the vascular endothelium lining of blood vessels. And we know that SARS-CoV-2 um, is, or, or COVID is very much a vasculopathy. Um, and so could it be that, um, that SARS-CoV-2 is actually somehow um, activating or releasing, if you want to say, uh, Bartonella that is Leaking them up. vascular endothelium? That's a really interesting thought, I think. Well, the BZ is kind of in there too. So, so I should have asked any other comments on the clinical, we kind of zoomed over exam, but I think we all mentioned exam. Um, I wanted Chris, to look at, yeah. It, just one more very quick comment to emphasize what, you know, St Stephen and Charlotte just said is what, we actually saw in our early testing of sick veterinarians is that many of these people were just fine until 
they had an extreme stress in their life or you know literally anything from being hit by a car to having a family member die to going through a divorce and that spurred the onset of their illness and i think it emphasizes and in veterinary medicine we know that we follow cats belonging to our veterinary students for three years and for three years i could look could culture Bartonella out of that cat's blood. We know that we can maintain a dog infected with Ehrlichia in a laboratory setting for up to six years. And as long as that dog is distressed, it probably won't get sick. And we know the same thing in regard to Babesia. So it, you know, there is a lot of evolutionary adaptation that's occurred that allows us and the pets and other animals to survive with these organisms. The question is, do we pay a price? And if we are stressed or if we are co-infected with another agent or right. if some strange virus comes along that nobody's ever seen before, I think all those things become possibilities. And I think this does bring up a clinical um, issue that I think has occurred in medicine in the time I've been in practice, which is I occasionally say, which is not completely accurate, Stress does not cause disease. <laughs> Stress causes immune problems. Stress causes vascular problems that allows wherever the weakness is in the individual to perhaps manifest. And I think very often our patients, because we see, see what you see, we see the car accident and all of a sudden the person had Lyme. I used to jokingly lecture on menopause in Lyme and say, well, well, maybe it's that they're sitting in the middle of the field, you know, having their hot flashes. And so they get bit by a tick, you know, because <laughs> why, why does hormonal change, both in menarche and menopause sometimes be associated? But I think it's important for us as clinicians to understand, to not say, well, gosh, it's because, you know, you lost this family member. That's not perhaps the source of the illness, but rather what allowed the illness to manifest. Um, and I, I sure see this a lot in my patients. So, all right. Amy this speaks to like the MACFS literature. You know, so for years and years and years, uh, how many MACFS patients have I, have I seen come in where they come in with a, a stress that started it all? And just yeah. like Ed had said with his veterinarian patients. And so, you know, we have to wonder, you know, there's been a lot of looks at, at Lyme for MECFS. I, I I think it's a very heterogeneous group. It's not just one infection, I don't think, for that category. But, um, but yeah, agree on all fronts. Yeah. Um, 